Hi, Ron. I'm Thibaut uh, Colanza, he, him. I'm based out of San Francisco here, and I'm a, a product data operations manager. Um, I joined Niantic two, week, two, two years ago, uh, very much when we started doing uh, large-scale scanning operations. So uh, I come with this background of um, running um, scanning for Niantic, um, and so uh, trying to share these uh, with you all. Um, with me, Isabel. Hi, everyone. My name is Isabel, pronouns she, her. Um, I'm a newer member here at Niantic, uh, currently helping with uh, data operations, uh, specialty in data annotation, but I have about 50 days now of scanning experience, uh, thanks to Tifo, <laughs> that um, I'll be sharing uh, later on in today's presentation. Um, Yvonne, uh, or Evan, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Evan. Um, I'm a developer support engineer on the eighth wall side. Um, and I'll pass it to Gilberto. Sorry. <laughs> hi, I'm Gilberto, um, developer support engineer on the Lightship side. And yeah, I'm available for help for answering questions whenever you have them. Oh, thank you. So this is the team that we're going to work on uh, with uh, this today. So. Um, so this is generally the, the path or like the, the, the journey that as a, uh, a developer, an AR developer, you will take whenever you're building an AR experience using BPS. Um, so of course, from choosing at which locations or creating the locations that you're going to build your location, at, your experience at, uh, scanning, which is basically going to be the main topic of today, uh, the activation part, the remote authoring or the authoring, uh, and then finally, journey that is uh, um, accomplished by uh, going at the location and trying your experience in real life, uh, sometimes more than once. So um, so this is basically the, the, the general uh, journey that we expect our developers to, to follow. Um, and today, we're going to focus more specifically on the on the tools and on the techniques that you're going to use. So the, in terms of tool set, um, the, you should already be familiar with our geospatial browser, which is um, part of both Aethol and Lightship. That um, is this, this map, which is basically the, the, for you to browse the Niantic map, see some of our uh, 20 million locations that we have, if those are not sufficient for you, you can also create your own uh, locations that ultimately uh, get available um, for you uh, and for the, the, the rest of the communities uh, to, uh, to build your AI, uh, your AI experience set. Um, so super handy tool, uh, you know, it's just a, a web app, so it can be accessed from any, any browser. Um, and uh, it, it should be very much a similar experience between Aethol and Nightship. Um, so that is definitely one of the tools that uh, we are investing in and that you, you guys should be already familiar with. Uh, the other one, which is uh, basically the application, is uh, our scanning app. So currently it's the, the Wafer app. It's, uh, so if you scan this QR code number eight, it should redirect you to our, uh, either our iOS or Android version of the Wayfair app. Uh, that will be the main uh, uh, the main app for uh, gathering the scans and creating the scans that we will then uh, submit to our servers to contribute to the map. So it's not only a scanning app, it has also a similar features as the, the geospatial browser in a way that you can browse the different locations. You can also create your own location. And uh, the extra tool that you have is um, to actually be able to edit uh, some locations or suggest edits uh, so that uh, those are um, reflected to the Niantic maps or generally, you know, improving the title, improving the, uh, the description of the location and possibly as well uh, adding more pictures that uh, might fit better your, your use case. Um, so the Wafer app is actually, so I'm just going to show you a few screens. So of course you, you have the, the, the Niantic, the, the Niantic uh, signed in for developers, so Lightship and Aethol, the map that, that we just mentioned, uh, a logbook, which is where you aggregate all the contribution that you do to the map, so normally mainly the scans, and of course this uh, you can see your your profile and, uh, and review it. 
Um, so those are the, the different tools. And so where does do, uh, how to use those tools? So the um, uh, journey that there's four steps when it comes to scanning. So the first um, one will be, uh, that would be next slide, please, uh, Papa. Um, the, um, so the first step is to either select or uh, create the new location. And I'm just waiting for the next step to, the next slide to move. There you go. So to select uh, uh, your location or create it, so you can do it either from the Wafer app or the Geospatial Browser. Essentially, as soon as you have a location or either created or, or selected, you can add scans to it using the Wafer. So the, the, the Wafer app is the, the app that you use to scan. You'll upload all those scans. And then uh, after a certain amount of time that we're going to review, you'll be able to activate or reactivate the, the location that would then mean that the location is VPS activated and ready for you um, to uh, to build your AR experience with. Um, so now we're, uh, the, the, we're just going to go through the very first step, which is how to select your location. So in the geospatial browser, um, as we were showing in the GIF a bit, uh, or the video earlier, so you can click on any of those locations or here click on create public location that would um, make it um, available and automatically an ID is generated with this um, with this location. So it's a, we call it a POI ID. And this POI ID will basically be the information that we tie all your scans with. And um, um, so um, that's definitely uh, the, the first step. So you can do it from here. And uh, in the Wafer app, you can also do it from there. So either you search, you look for the location, or you click on the little icon here on the right hand side that is um, that is, uh, allows you to uh, create this new location. In a similar manner here, for you you can do it from either way. The 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 dates are reflected immediately in the Niantic map in the back end. The POI ID is generated, and that basically allows you to um, create and uh, scan the location right away. Um, you can also look uh, in either system, you can look for all the locations that are already VPS activated, which means that normally uh, you don't need to uh, scan, or you could scan to, uh, for example, improve um, the, the location, make it uh, more di like diverse or have uh, more uh, chances of, of localization later on using VPS. Uh, so this is the, the options of like uh, using this sort of VPS feature. It's also available on the geospatial browsers with a similar uh, filtering system here. So now that assuming that you have a, you have uh, selected your location or created it, the next step for you is to actually go there and scan. So this is where I'm ending to uh, Isabel, who is going to take us through uh, what are the steps or what are techniques and suggestions on uh, when it comes to scanning locations. Right, awesome. Thank you so much, Timo. All right, so before going out and scanning, we do recommend a couple of preparation steps here. Uh, first, check the weather. Uh, maybe you're not a fan of being out in the rain, but that said, rain is actually okay to scan in. Um, also choose your device. Uh, though LiDAR is preferred and available in iPhone 12 Pros and beyond, it's definitely not required. Um, if you do happen to use a device that is lacking in LiDAR, uh, this is taken care of in the back end. After choosing your device, ensure it is charged, maybe pack an external battery, uh, particularly if you are going to be doing a lot of scanning, um, planning your route. Um, for my folks in LA, I think you know what I mean when I say you probably don't want to be caught in the uh, LA parking lot, as I call it. Um, so, um, you know, take that into consideration when you go out and scan. And then uh, kind of driving home the point of, you know, remember to create the location GSB or verify that it at least exists. All right. Now, let's say you get to your location, you're ready to scan. How do you do that? Uh, so the first thing you'll want to do is um, find that location on the map uh, using the Wayfarer app, um, selecting the location card, as we call it, as you can see here in that middle screenshot, and then clicking on the scan button. Now, I do want to call out, there is more than one scan button, but this is the recommended scan button. Um, uh, Paul, if we can go to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit more about where this other scan button is. All right, so as you can see in this 
right hand screenshot, there is a general scan button. Um, if you do happen to click that, complete a scan, no worries. You can um, choose a location to align it with after the scan, but it's just easy for, um, I'll say the experience of using the Wafer app to select the scan button from the location card. All right, so let's say you've hit that scan button. What happens next? So uh, what you'll see is uh, your uh, device will transition into scanning mode. Um, you'll click the white circle to start the scan. Um, each scan uh, will need at least 20 seconds, but we'll note that we are, are hoping for one minute per scan. Um, after you're done scanning, you'll click the stop button um, in the bottom middle, and from there, uh, your device will process the mesh, and the Wafer app will let you know how you did. Um, you can exit out of the scan at any time by tapping the X in the upper left-hand corner. I do want to say that uh, though the Wafer app does provide a uh, scan quality classifier, um, you know, don't be discouraged if it's not good quality. It still might be a good scan. So let's go on to the next slide. So when you're scanning, uh, definitely walk at a slow, natural pace. Allow your device to uh, take, the, take in the surroundings, if you will. Uh, the location should always be the focal point. You'll want to introduce some variation. Uh, into the scan, um, you know, between um, distances, angles, um, ensuring that each minute is different, and then move the device with you like a crab walk. Um, and just a reminder again, one scan is one minute. All right, next slide, please. Now you might be wondering, how am I going to capture a this POI? Well, we do have a couple of recommendations as to how to navigate around it. Um, the circular movement where you can use concentric circles, which will naturally vary um, how close you are to that POI. The spiral movement uh, where you're walking out in a circular movement from that POI. And then our highly recommended movement, the flower movement, um, which can be adjusted along with these other movements um, based on the kind of POI it is. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Pablo, uh, we do have some visuals as to how this will look like. So for instance, if you have a flat object that you're scanning, um, you'll want to uh, move alongside of it. Uh, if you're doing a corner, you'll probably not you know, collect a 360, but more of a 270 degree. Um, and then for smaller objects, you'll adjust accordingly. All right, so just remember to scan again from, oh, sorry. Actually, let's go ahead and go right into these. Um, <laughs> thank you, Pablo. Uh, just remember to, again, uh, scan, you know, zero to 10 meters away from a location, or if you use feet like me, zero to 35 feet, and scan from as many different angles as possible. All right. So here in this slide, we do have a couple of, of examples of, of our operator uh, collecting these scans. Uh, you'll notice here our operator is uh, varying height, angle, distance. Um, and in fact, um, you'll see that, well, actually these uh, examples are captures done on different days, trying to take into consideration the variability um, of the weather um, specific to this uh, POI. Um, it is good to have cap different captures done at different times of day, again, to capture different shadows, different situations, what have you. Um, you'll notice that in these two scans, there are very similar weather, um, but different shadows. Yeah. Technique is the same. You see one, one thing that uh, people tend not to do by default is like varying the height of the, um, of the phone. That, that brings a bit more uh, different perspectives, um, especially when you have you know, users with different uh, heights. Um, so that, that sort of like uh, mimics the different position the other um, or another users could have with their phone. Um, and that also brings a, a bit more coverage. Um, so yeah, um, really trying to be as 360 as possible. And um, one, one other thing is that here, fortunately, we're, we're, it's not too busy, but um, whenever possible, trying to um, prevent moving objects to be in the frame. Things like you know large cars, uh, buses, uh, or um, like just crowds of people moving around. 
the, so although our, our our algorithm is like pretty good at um, identifying and like removing those uh, moving objects afterwards so that they don't show up in the mesh, um, we are it's it's probably it's better to not capture it in the in the first place. So um, um, always be mindful of your surroundings here. <clears throat> Understand uh, like the the crowd movements, things like this. Um, and um, depending on on the the locations, uh, as uh, Isabel was saying, like planning your routes uh, before, so that perhaps you're going to activate or scan the locations that might have more people at um, at, at at days of the day, uh, times of the day that have a bit less uh, uh, traffic. So, um, yeah. This is a, a good example of how to scan a, a waste spot. And this one is sort of like the perfect waste spot because it's, it's a statue, but. And as Tiva was mentioning, there are definitely things we want to avoid capturing in these scans. Um, your fingers, definitely one of them. Please avoid the inclination, but if you do happen to, you're not alone. Uh, you do happen to capture people. Um, we do have algorithms that anonymize the scans, but this is generally a good practice in terms of um, social awkwardness and etiquette, if you will. Um, and as Hiba was mentioning, you know, definitely uh, keep in mind safety um, and movement of crowds. Um, we do also recommend avoiding scanning when the location is too far away or too close. Um, if you do happen to also point your phone at a very bright or reflective object, such as the sun, what does with glare, uh, this can throw off the scan along with moving too fast or not moving at all. Um, we also recommend avoiding uploading any scans that look incomplete or not representative. Um, and then of course, avoiding heavy rain and snow while recording. Um, but that said, um, if you do happen to go to an area that has had heavy rain or snow, this can actually be a great thing to scan as it does introduce some variability into the scans. All right, and last but not least, after you've completed your hard work of scanning, don't forget to upload. Um, just uh, to give a ballpark, a five minute scan can weigh about 250 megabytes. And as a result, we do recommend for efficient data usage to upload on Wi-Fi after all of your planned scans are completed. Um, after you do upload your scan, note that the processing time for the scan to appear in the location um, card, either in GSB uh, or on the Wayfair app, is about two hours after upload. And with that being said, I'll hand it back over to Tipo. We'll talk a little bit more about UPS activation. Great. So what happens after? So you have the scans that uh, were, were uploaded. You've waited the time for them to, to reflect. Um, Normally, you have those different um, possible statuses that you have uh, at a given location. So either you're not ready for activation, which means you don't you have less than ten scans. Um, when if you have those ten scans that are uploaded, we have the this minimum requirement that is a, a, a way to sort of force the diversity of the the scans at, um, uh, gathered at a single location that. The, the minimum time difference between those two are of uh, five hours. Uh, that's uh, absolute number, like an uh, hour of the day. So uh, even if it's two, uh, uh, like they were gathered on like two day, two different days, but uh, both of them were done at noon, that does not count as like five hour difference. So it's really, you. for example, you need to have some scan, at least one scan done at, let's say, uh, 10, 10 a.m. and uh, one scan done at uh, 3 p.m. That will uh, ensure that you have at least two different scans at two different times of the day. So it's it's uh, uh, a way for um, uh, us to, to force the, um, the time difference. Um, and so once you have those two uh, combined, so 10 scans and the uh, variability in, um, in the time of the day, then your location is ready for activation. So um, the other part is that once it's activated, you can even uh, reactivate. Uh, we'll we'll talk a bit more about like what what why would you want to reactivate? But uh, for reactivation, you have uh, the need for submitting five additional scans after the last time it was activated. Um, so yeah, uh, if we move on to the to the next slide. Um, 
this is how you would do for activation or reactivation. So in the geospatial browser, you would open the, the, the card and um, at the bottom, you have this activate, uh, reactivate button. So in this case, uh, in the example here, we're showing that the, the, the um, uh, location doesn't have enough scans to reactivate. So uh, that's why the, the button is being grayed out. Um, should it would it have enough? You'd be able to click here, reactivate, and that sends uh, the request to our backend that would that we would gen, uh, then uh, uh, take into account for uh, for processing. Um, the next slide shows to do the same thing from the Wayfair app. So basically, you open the location card, um, you scroll down to the VPS section of the card, and this is where you have to um, activate or reactivate button. Um, you can also see it's quite handy here. You can see the, um, uh, the the little histogram that shows the distribution of the scans per time of the day. And that's what I was mentioning earlier is that the, um, the diversity, it kind of shows you how diverse or how, uh, how spread around the day those scans are and um, why you need to have uh, at least a five hour difference between uh, between two of those. So this is a, a, a simple way to, to check it out. Um, in case you have additional scans that are submitted and that are, have not been used for um, activation, those uh, scans I think will show up as a sort of uh, additional or stacked bar on top of them. Um, so showing you that you, you, you could, um, that, they, that those scans have been taken into account, they just haven't been used for the next activation. Um, yeah, so that's how you would do for, for, for activating or reactivating. Um, as for um, uh, like what to expect from there. So um, as uh, Isabel mentioned, the, the, the average time for scan processing is about two hours. So that's basically the moment uh, from the moment it's, it's left or it was uploaded from your uh, device to uh, the moment it hit our server. And then it, it's gone through our scan processing pipeline, which encompasses several steps, including uh, the anonymization of the of the scan, which means that all the all, all the um, you know the faces, the license plates are being uh, scraped out of the um, of the scan, uh, along from the metadata extractions uh, that we have, the association with your waste with the with the location, etc. So uh, all of that you can expect it to take about two hours. For the activation or reactivation, the journey, the, the average processing time. So this is what we call uh, in the backend, it's our, um, our mapping process. It takes about four hours. So it's um, uh, selecting our uh, most recent scans and uh, the, um, uh, yeah, the most recent scan that have been submitted and uh, including them to building the map. Uh, this takes about four hours from activation requests to activation uh, um, being complete. <clears throat> um, assuming that the, the activation works well. There are some cases where activation can fail. Um, and so it's possible to um, reach out for us uh, for any help in this case, because uh, we're here to help with anything that's related to um, um, activation issues. And it can happen, uh, and, and we are definitely here to help. Um, so yeah, this is for um, what to expect in terms of timeline once uh, location is activated. So what, what happens after that is that luckily your activation has been, uh, your location is uh, active, you have a beautiful mesh that has been uh, built for the location. And then from there on, you are able to uh, retrieve it, likely um, include it into your uh, AR experience authoring, and uh, and from there on, you'll be able to um, um, basically make your magic app. Um, this is where you're retrieving the mesh. I guess here you're importing it into either a cloud editor and uh, perhaps doing a bit of magic in you know, Blender or Unity, and um, and then uh, building. In this case, it's a it's a eight four AR experience uh, that allows you to uh, localize and then add some some more magic to it. Um, so yeah, that, that's generally the steps going after the the activation. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's basically about it.
Pablo, you want to take over from there? Yeah, thank you so much, both of you, Isabel and Thibault, for all of the great information. Um, we got a couple of questions during that. Um, I know we had an anonymous participant talk a little bit about the ARDK 3.4 updates. Gilberto, thank you for answering that. Uh, but then we have two more, uh, more questions. One is actually three questions within it, but um, would love to see if Kyle, if you're still around, if you'd like to ask your question uh, directly. You can see me, you can't hear me. <clears throat> yeah. I've done a bunch of scans and I had a few technical issues that brought up to Pablo. I'm not gonna go through that specifically, but I wanted to just understand the technique that you were mentioning in terms of the flower structure. So are you saying that flower structure should be uh, one minute for each leaf, right? Is that kind of? Not necessarily, I, especially if you, I guess it, it will depend on the, uh, the, the geometry of the waste spot, but generally in one minute, you are able to do a bit more than just uh, one, uh, one leaf of the, of the flower. Uh, it, it, assuming you're walking at a slow pace, uh, pointing your camera and like going from this 10 meter, getting closer and then back out. So basically you're, you're going out. I guess in, within one minute, you're able to do about one or two petals, let's, let's call it this. And, um, and that should, uh, yeah, basically, I, I would be surprised if by walking at a slow natural pace, you take just one minute to, to do one petal. Um, okay, but, <clears throat> but what I'm saying is also, you wouldn't do the scan of all the petals, depending upon the size, in a single state scan. You would try and get the minute moving back and forth and then move on to your, you know, uh, that your planned uh, walk around the particular uh, item that you're working on. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, you can you can combine. So basically, when we were having uh, when we're sending surveyors uh, on on locations, the the they would submit to us a five minute scan, and during this five minute scan, they would use a combination of the different patterns that that we would do, and so. Basically, um, when you submit the scan to us, uh, we automatically split it in, in uh, segments of one minute. And so each minute counts for one scan. So even though your, your one sc single scan session is uh, five minutes, when it's uploaded on our backend, we consider it uh, five different one minute scans. Um, so yeah, you can... Um, um, you, you could uh, you could do longer like a three minute scan uh, using the flower pattern and stuff then you know um, try again and do another pattern uh, so that wouldn't be that, that wouldn't be a, a problem yeah not at all okay I did run into one issue uh, using a, a way spot that had already been scanned and when I went in to use it uh, and I opened it up in um, blender, it wasn't in the middle of the grid. It was actually about, you know, three meters off center. So, you know, I had to keep on going out there and trying to build there. And I ended up just going to use a different way spot. So I don't know if that's, if there's anything that can be done to bring it back into the center of the grid. That's a good question. Um, I've had the same, I've had a similar experience where the default anchor or like the, the, the origin was not aligned with the actual um, location. So, um, but that was a couple of years ago. So we, we had to, I had to manually basically put an offset, uh, which was a bit, uh, you know, not great because you need to check the offset directly at the location. So it's not good. Um, I don't know even or Gilberto, if you, if you experienced that or how you'd suggest that to be fixed. I'm, I'm not sure if we're, we're able to remote author that. So, um, so first off, that is uh, that's what we call like an edge case. It shouldn't happen. Uh, if you see this happening, uh, report it. Give us a ticket. We can, man as Jabal uh, said, we can manually change it. But as a scan, like if you scan it and you see that, you shouldn't. <laughs> you should report that. Yeah, it makes work a little tougher in, in Blender. Mm -hmm. And then um, I did a bunch of scans, you know, just trying to probably over a month to scan six locations with doing about 50 scans. And I noticed occasionally when I would go back to do initial scan in a location that 
the waypoint or waypoint that I had created did not show up on the map anymore. And I don't know if you pull things off of there just because you feel like they shouldn't be scan points. That's a good. Uh, that's a good point. Um, normally, locations, uh, especially when they're submitted by, by developers, uh, they should be um, uh, sort of like static or like uh, not modifiable. Um, it, this is typically some. So first, when it's it's not there, it's likely that you don't see it, but it's still in the background. So in, in case these situations happen, please report report it to us. Uh, we can like restore them or like uh, just make sure that it, they're visible to you. Um, because it's a community map, sometimes users uh, of, uh, of our games or other developers, they can submit uh, modification requests to, uh, to a, a location. Um, and so um, this can impact, for example, the, the exact location, the title, the, the, the description of it. Uh, we try to, um, especially when they are uh, built for AR experiences, they are not visible in the games. So all our players should like not be... Uh, concerned and that not, not see it. So basically, <laughs> you're really kind of safe, but it's not impossible that since they're in the Niantic map that other people see it. Um, I think we're bringing some features around that where to be able for um, for a, uh, a, a developer to have a sort of um, locations that uh, cannot be seen or modified or uh, by anyone else but them. Um, I know this is something we're working on. But uh, that's part of like having it in the in the global map is that everyone can can see and interact with it. But if it happens or if it happened, uh, Kyle, please do report it to us. We have all the tools to like re restore it, bring it back, especially if you have scans associated to it. Uh, that's a lot of work that we, we definitely don't want you to uh, to lose. So, uh, but normally make sure that we like you can be assured that we have uh, all the data still, so uh, we should be able to restore it. Okay, I did run into that also. I did a bunch of scans, probably 36 in one day across hours. And when I went in, they hadn't registered um, with the majority of the locations I had done. So would that be because I scanned them too soon or do they just disappear and they're not counted at all? That that's, we'd have to look into it. Uh, the, the recommendation that Isabel did, which is, when you go at the location using the Wi-Fi app, you select the, the card and then you uh, you start scanning. That sort of forces the POI ID to be attached with the scan in the in your device. So um, basically, no matter when or how you upload it after, the backend is able to reconcile. Oh, this ID is for this guy. So uh, let let me reattach it. Um, I if you hadn't done it, where and perhaps you know you use the the um, the other the other option where you don't necessarily uh, need to attach a waste spot or it's only at the end and it's something you can skip that also could be a, an issue with the um, with the app itself so please report it as well okay okay great thank you awesome thank you all so much for that um, and great questions there Kyle uh, we have a couple of questions from I'm sorry if I mispronounce it Shakar. Uh, would you like to also unmute? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, my first question is about uh, VPS support uh, across uh, various uh, regions. Uh, are there any limitations on uh, uh, other regions around the world uh, except uh, the, the US or Western uh, Europe? Um, I, I'm not, I don't think we have right now. Uh, it seems like we've activated locations in, uh, I think every continent now. Um, and apart from where we have, um, uh, perhaps some restrictions in, uh, in China, because they don't uh, allow API calls from, uh, Google, uh, this is, uh, I think this might be one of the only things, but I, perhaps Gilberto, you, you can, can confirm. Uh, I was just going to say, like, mainland China is definitely one of those. Uh, we've seen it happen in other countries, but uh, I don't think we have a list. Uh, this is a good um, request, though, and it's something that we've been, like, trying to get. <laughs> uh, but I think what you've also said, it makes sense. Like, as long, kind of a rule of thumb is, like, if it's, if Google is allowed, we basically are allowed, uh, there are going to okay. be some exceptions. So I think it's good to actually request this. 
Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, um, my second question is about uh, indoors, uh, more specifically about uh, public uh, spaces like museums. Let's say if I have a customer, uh, which is a museum, a public museum, uh, is um, is it uh, will we all be able to have a VPS uh, scan uh, in those uh, museums? Yeah, we've done it in the past, and like uh, uh, we already have some locations which are indoor. Uh, in um, as you say, in, in malls or public spaces or um, uh, yeah, the other museums. So it's possible to have to have it there. Um, museum they tend to already have a lot of their um, um, especially permanent collection uh, already uh, you know declared as a as a as a location in in our Niantic map. So I would just recommend to check if it's not a duplicate. Uh, if not, you can definitely create it. Um, we've had that done for, uh, I think, a museum in um, in Vienna, although I'm not sure if they were in indoor, but be, be them indoor or outdoor, it shouldn't be a problem for you. Okay, thank you about that. Uh, and uh, my like last to, question is... Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I'd like to add just a little bit. Uh, it is doable. Uh, it is not the default. Uh, so you might have to reach out if you want to have that in. Uh, as default, we will uh, reject scans from private areas. Whatever we like, the, the like the team will kind of see if there's if it seems like it's indoors. It usually by default will get uh, rejected. Mm -hmm. So if you are planning on doing something indoors, do reach out. Uh, it is possible. It's not like you need like extra permissions or anything. It's just we don't want to like you getting filtered out. <laughs> you know. So yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, and my last question about, uh, do you have information about, uh, when one of the, <clears throat> when I'm talking with, uh, customers, one of the questions is about accuracy, uh, precision recall of, uh, VPS scans. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, after, let's say I've, I've set up uh, the scan and it's public, uh, but then comes the, the end user, uh, with their mobile phone and, and they um, and they scan uh, the point of interest in order to uh, to see the uh, experience. And um, can you share a little bit of information about the precision and recall? Because it's one of the concerns that when I talk with potential customers, is how well would it uh, work in matters of accuracy? Um, Gilberto, even you want to take a step at this one? I just want to clarify when you say. Um... Accuracy, do you mean because we have like there's accuracy in like once you're localized, uh, you know, I place this object, like how accurate it's going to be, and that is just centimeters, so it's like three to five centimeters accurate. Uh, but if you mean if you mean more like, um, I created this point of interest and now I'm localizing towards it, uh, that I don't have at the top of my head, and uh, but it's a little bit more complicated than just like accuracy, right? It's more like how long does it take me to, to like localize and make sure that I'm there. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure which one you meant. Uh, the localization. I mean, uh, the accuracy of uh, the actual localization. Uh, when when I want to do the localization, uh, <clears throat> and so how well does it recognize the environment? Uh, not the 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 first. Uh, the first option, which is how accurate is the placement of the object uh, compared to, let's say, the anchors or um, the point, um, the point cloud. So, uh, how, how, what if you have information about the accuracy of the localization itself? I I don't have it at the top of my head. I think this, if you can. Uh, just ask it on like one of our support and channels. I can give you more precise information. Uh, it's just I don't have it right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was wondering if you know it's it, if it's ninety eight, ninety seven, uh, ninety nine. Then you know it's 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 one area. But if it's around the eighties, so I, I I need to set expectation with my customers, uh, knowing that uh, one in every five scans, uh, I would need some um, fallback. Uh, like a cure code uh, just for that. Uh, 
Uh, no, um, so you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Um, it should be pretty easy to like localize. It does depend on things like the the quality of the scans or how many of them, and like you know. So that's where like the the time of day comes in, you know. But it sh you sh like it should be pretty simple. Again, I want to give you numbers. I just don't know them on the top of my head. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, great questions. Awesome, um, we have a comment from David Bennett, but I think it's worth maybe noting if there's some potential solutions for this. Um, they're pretty much pointing to the fact that they tried to scan a sign that was identical on two sides. And when you looked at it from the South and the North, um, there was some difficulty in aligning the scan data. Do you all have any recommendations for how to go about um, solving for that? Yeah, so it's anything that has uh, symmetry in it, right? Um, so that that's uh, uh, something that's... Um, so there, there are some locations that are pretty bad candidates for VPS. Things that are... Um, that have a lot of symmetry uh, uh, access or even complete symmetry, like a, um, a round, like a sphere, for example. A sphere uh, is, is especially like a, a um, uniform sphere is pretty bad. Um, so one of the recommendation here uh, is that when you're scanning, uh, this is where you can not only focus on the subject and like capture some of the surrounding that will sort of add additional anchors to the location, so that um, when you're trying to localize, the system is uh, the, the 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 map is able to check from uh, that other uh, part of the of the location, um, yeah. and normally if you have very different backgrounds, which means like from one side of the sign, you have perhaps you know, a skyline. And on the other side of the sign, you have a, a forest or like a park or some trees. Normally the symmetry should, you should be able to break down the symmetry with that a good inclusion of, of the background. Um, so um, yeah, but generally when you have a lot of like symmetry axes or like complete symmetry in the, in there, it's it, the, the location is, is is not a great candidate for um, uh, for VPS experience. That, does that answer your 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 question, uh, David? Oh uh, yes, thanks, thanks, thanks very much. Awesome, great, thank you all. Uh, we have a question from Imam. Uh, I see that you're still in the Zoom. Would you like to unmute and ask it yourself? Looks like no. All righty. So um, they mentioned that it. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's literally that uh, that I write there. So when I scanning a white spot, uh, it's a little bit uh, surrounded with a lot of leaves and organic pattern. And when I upload it, it's come out uh, the uh, the mess is a bit duplicated or double, uh, like there's offset, uh, there's uh, offset uh, between uh, the um, uh, the mess and uh, how, uh, is there a tips uh, how to avoid this? But I'm not, I'm not sure uh, which pattern that I used to scan this mess. Uh, it might be the wrong technique, but I just want to know, uh, is there a better tips to doing this? Uh, I think that's it. <laughs> let, let, let me try to rephrase uh, what, what, the, what the issue is. So basically, you, you provided uh, uh, several types of scans, and uh, including one that had um, um, like leaves or organic pattern on it. And when you uh, when it uh, was activated in the mesh, you could see there was some sort of offset between uh, the two parts of the mesh, where, for example, the, the plane should have been only one, and you would see two planes on, a, on top of each other, for example. Uh, yes, I think. Yes. Okay, okay. Um, so in those cases, um, so this is where we we want. Uh, I mean, it's good to have this diversity of like uh, um, at different times of the year or a different uh, um, a different time of the day, etc. So that we have we have a good uh, uh, distribution of the uh, of the yeah the, the different like set, uh, patterns that the location can have. Um, one thing if, so I would recommend you can reactivate the location here. So submitting more scans or uh, reaching out to us uh, so that we can like force the reactivation. 
And when we do, we have a way to sort of like disable certain scans that we, we can see or can, can sub we can suppose that they are creating uh, too much uh, too much noise here. Um, so we have a way to do it. Um, so again, don't hesitate to reach out. Tell us uh, which location you have the issue at, and like uh, we can have a look at the at the at the location and um, and do this sort of like uh, filtering out of which scans to use for the activation and which uh, which not to. So um, yeah, we have we have this option in the back end. So. Um, I think there, there would be something, but perhaps here additional scans and a reactivation might also do the work. And, and again, if you're doing a reactivation, remember you need uh, five new scans, uh, so five one minute scans uh, that are submitted after the last reactivation time, the last activation time. All right, sure, thank you. Uh, about the uh, uh, Organic pattern about the leaf is it uh, uh, have the effect about the output of the scan or uh, it's doesn't matter. I, I guess it, it, we'd have to 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 check out the, the location and how how you know how important or how uh, much noise that could have happened, especially like if the leaves are are hitting uh, hiding sorry some uh, um, some uh, anchoring features. This is where it could be. It could be tricky uh, for, for the system to know um, uh, where it is. So um, I again, um, I better check out the location together, and uh, we can we can identify where to go on from there. But generally, it's great to capture at you know fall and then when there's no leaves and when there's snow, um, so that uh, when the map is created, it's a combination of all of that. So. When one user comes to try your experience at the location, no matter what um, the, the setup they have uh, that they they are getting, we might have in the we have in the back end uh, this uh, this reference that is as close as what they are currently experiencing. So it's it's really not not bad to have it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. We have. Time for one more question. We have one in the Q&A from Mark um, as well. Would you like to unmute and ask? Sure, thanks. Um, so is VPS suitable for residential areas? Say, for example, I want to create an AR experience in my neighborhood or near my home or even in my home. Uh, I can take that. Um, so there's two things there. So for like, Quick, uh, quick answer is no, not for residential, definitely. The the problem there is just the safety, like the security of the data, right? So the the scans would be public. And so if you you could like basically dox yourself, then we don't want that. We want to like stay away from all that, right? right. Um, there are things that you can do. So if it's just like a, if you just want to make it like, you know, your own app for your family to see, uh, you can use test scans that we won't guarantee they work for production level, but if it's just like your app that you want to do for yourself, go ahead. Um, but yeah, and then I saw the second part of that. Well, actually, you might as well ask it. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to get ahead of myself. A completely separate question is, um, is there provision within this system to accommodate temporary installations, ones that might not have permanent, um, you know, things? Yeah. Like I want to go to Burning Man and, you know, create yeah for that and then it goes away yeah. so that kind of goes back to a previous question of like on museums and stuff like that that are like kind of technically public but not really uh, those are the kind of, of things that you can reach out to us and, and we can help with like it's a doable thing for sure uh, we've done uh, this sort of thing in the past uh, for like Coachella where we set up things just for the event okay. uh, so it is doable you just kind of have to reach out to us and then we can like figure that out Okay, great, thanks. So I think we have a quick one that we can answer in the chat from Luis. Thibault and Isabel, you can probably take that so one. So where can you download the app? Uh, so we had this QR, the, the QR code earlier in the presentation, so that's the way I think to do. Uh, you can normally, if you have created a location, there you go. Uh, if you have created the location and you are at the, the scanning step in the interface, we're actually showing you the, the the same QR code to go there. Um, is it possible to scan using a drone 
and upload the photo and video later. So right now, um, it's like uh, scans that are pro like or, or videos that are uh, created outside of the scanning framework uh, of our applications, they, they won't be compatible with our uh, mapping pipeline. So not really. That being said, we we are doing it quite often with our research team to um, use um, scanning uh, like drone uh, footages to uh, to to contribute to um, especially large scans, but it's not something that's you know in production and available for users yet. Um, can you use uh, scans for commercial purposes? I guess uh, this one is like uh, as long as you are a, a light ship and uh, and and a full customer, I, that's the the, the the main purposes of it. I guess uh, to for you to be able to own, like create your experiences uh, to your um, uh, to the agencies that you're working with or directly with your customers. So um, definitely uh, interesting. And for example, export and sell on OpenSea or SMT or similar. Uh, so this is, uh, I guess, uh, OpenSea or SMT, this is more for the, the, the mesh, right? Like using using it to, to, to generate the, the mesh. I'm not really sure for that, actually. Uh, oh, what's, the, what's the term of services if you're just not selling the experience, but you're just selling the output from our mapping pipeline, if that's what you mean, uh, 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 Luis. Uh, 